one reason we, we love this old house and, uh, and with its beams and its tile floors is that we're surrounded by houses quite like it. This is the, maybe the smallest one, but it's busy. It's a neighborhood. We have people walking by, mowing the lawn. It's a, it's a real living community, and we've never, never tired of it. Old houses. Old houses are best. They have secrets. Shadows trembling everywhere in closet and corner. Their weaknesses secret. Cracks in the blocks, corroded pipes. The termites patient gnawing. Their strengths are secret too. The hand carved attic beam. The portrait paneled over. A feeling they've earned their way. Every board in the house has been pressed by finger and foot, forehead and knee. Tears on old tiles have worn their stories. Stories spread through the rooms like the scent of gardenias. We breathe stories here. We inhale old passions, exhale the dead resolutions that are still moving. In the closet there is something. Sun slants through casement windows, around slender candles, shattering on the wicker where we sit in love with the shadows. Old houses are best. Old oaks bend over them, whispering, it's all right, it's all right. All those kids had fun. And remember that young couple who had such love for each other. It overflowed and did the azaleas sing and birds blaze like roses. And even the garage, long ago burned down, was an object of affection. Poetry has changed uh, enormously. For one thing, when I was writing, I was writing in an old-fashioned way, and I wrote the uh, sonnets and I was interested in form and I would get notes back from places like the New Yorker saying well we're not publishing sonnets or rhyme verse and it was sort of discouraging to me and I, I certainly began writing more free verse and all that but over the years it has come full circle or it's better than full circle in a way I think now poetry is open to all kinds of forms it's sort of what what happened in in uh, with haircuts you know it used to be very clear. There was long-haired people and there were short-haired people and the long hair often were, were women, but now anybody can wear anything and can have any kind of hairdo. And this is true in writing. Uh, I think you open the, the pages of The Atlantic and The New Yorker and Poetry and you'll see experimental poems that are going upside down and backwards and blank spaces and you'll find sonnets and villanelles at the same time and syllabic poetry. So. I, I think that now they are not warring anymore, the free verse and, and, and formal poetry. And I think it's been a positive thing. And the other positive thing is the, the internet. And now you can publish online, online magazines. You can publish your own books. I'm not sure of how that affects our quality. I'm still suspicious uh, of it. But it certainly has opened it up, and it's, it's been one of the major changes. This is a poem I wrote about uh, my mother who lived in Winter Park and uh, lived in Orlando uh, part of the time. Uh, she was a music teacher and I wrote this a long time ago and I read it to her on uh, Mother's Day. And I'll say a little word about it after I, I've, I finish the poem. Artist of the Heart. When we were young, we couldn't imagine living to be over 30, nor did we deserve to. Everyone chain-smoked, drank till we dropped and drove like suicidal gangsters. Yet here I am at 60 in perfect health, except for fainting once in a while. And you, mother who always lied about your age, confess you're 86. You sit with your cronies playing bridge and permed respectability, still wishing there were men to flirt with. But you've outlived them all, sailing your old Buick across the desert of Orlando like the Queen of Arabia at 20 miles per hour, ignoring all traffic lights. 
years ago, running off with a piano player. How brave you were. For a woman born in 1960, this would be ordinary, even expected. But for a woman born in 1906, this was true courage. Oh, you should be awarded the President's Medal for impractical visionary valor. And didn't Harold run over you twice with that same Buick without breaking a single bone, your legs ballooning like a purple elephant's? And didn't you throw a TV set half as large as yourself at our father? I have often tried to misbehave as much as you, but it's difficult, difficult. Did any of this really happen? We can hardly remember what we did last Tuesday. Once at a party, you drank four martinis and played Chopin's Polonaise with a toothpick in your mouth, not missing a note. Now you get wobbly as a baby on a sliver of soccer tort. You can't hold your chocolate anymore. When you had your old face sandpaper, and it was painful, but you didn't care. Above your cheeks as smooth as Barbie's, your fierce, bruised eyes glinted like the witch of Endor's. Take that, father time, they said, you male pig. We were terrified. That's grandma, we told the kids. She's made some kind of pact. Still, you are the perfect mother. You remember everything I tell you. Even things I make up are as clear to you as the day they never happened. Each of us is convinced you love us the most. How do you do it? I think you are an artist of the heart. When you enter a room, a secret ray shazams from your withered breast to atomize my knees. On shaky feet, I approach you. The world slides away an insubstantial shadow. I am six years old forever, holding out my stick-like arms to you, mother, dearest mother. When I uh, read this to her, it was Mother's Day, so she asked us to take us out to the, I forget which now, the cafe something, and blue it had in it. And... Um, it was Mother's Day, and there were candles on the table. And she's not saying much about the poem. It ends nicely, so she had given me a hug. And she's very quiet, and she starts leaning across the table with its candles. You know, Jeannie, I think she's going up in flames. And she looked at me hard and says, you didn't leave out much, did you? <laughs> One reason that, that I like Wallace Stevens' poetry so much is I think that he had the same reaction to Florida that we did. We came down from Minnesota. We were freezing to death, and he, he would visit from uh, Hartford, Connecticut. And you can tell from his poetry that he was uh, very uh, moved by the, the lush colors and the, the birds and the flowers, the leafiness of everything. And we felt the same way, and as you look around our garden, we still do. So I thought I would read this poem of his that expresses both his and our uh, reaction to our state. It's called Nomad Exquisite. As the immense dew of Florida brings forth the big fin palms and green vine angering for life, as the immense dew of Florida brings forth him and him from the beholder, beholding all these green sides and gold sides of green sides and blessed mornings meet for the eye of the young alligator and lightning colors, so, in me, come flinging forms, flames, and the flakes of flames. I've always believed that, that poetry was extraordinarily valuable for people to read. And uh, I think that in our particular society, it is shortchanged. And we give uh, homage to poetry. But it, it's not something that our society has latched onto as uh, something because it's uh, it it doesn't bring money. It's it's you can't make a movie very easily out of, out of out of a poem. And one of the things that I think that's happened to our country, why we're we getting in so much trouble, is that we often have a failure of imagination. We get into these big problems overseas because nobody has a, 
the imagination to think what might happen when we get there. And you will, and this is why it's not an accident that, say, poets are almost entirely anti-war, let's, let's put it that way. To, uh, there must be some poet somewhere who's pro-war, but I've never met one, you know. And, it, and when the, you, you go tap into that on the, on the online, you'll see, you know, every poet in America has some kind of anti-war poem. And I think it's partially this, uh, this failure of imagination on America's part that has gotten us into trouble, Fail, a lack of sympathy for poor people. I think what poetry can do to people, and not necessarily everyone, of course, but it does expand that part of your mind that, that where empathy is, where you're trying to think you know, outside of your own head, but into a different viewpoint. But it's hard to do. It's slow. And our country, our society wants things to be fast. Television's fast. The Twitter poem, that's a good Good example. The Twitter poem is now the popular poem. This is what we like to do. And you can have wonderful Twitter poems. There's no doubt about it. But it's not an accident that, that most poems in English are, are at least as long as a sonnet, where you have time to develop a thought and a reaction. And uh, we need to have more people read poetry and to try to uh, expand their imagination, I think we would be better off. I think it's not an impractical thing.